Hi, my name is Kelvin Newman and welcome to the Brighton SEO podcast, where we share talks from one of the world's most popular search marketing conferences. The event started out as a few people meeting in an upstairs room of a pub and is now attended by over 3,000 people from all over the world. This episode is a recording of one of the speakers at a recent event. So without further ado, uh, I'll introduce you to, uh, to Guy Levine uh, from Return on Digital, uh, who is going to talk about spending a million dollars on Facebook and what was the, uh, what was the result of that. So uh, yeah, put your hands together for Guy, please. Yeah, cool. Right, this is my first time at Brighton, and I can guarantee you one thing, I'm going to give it absolutely everything, so bear with me. I'm Northern, if you can't understand the accent, tough shit. (laughs) So, um, yeah, it's also great to be talking about Facebook at an SEO event, and I'm just so proud of every one of you that have turned up here, because we all know where the future is. Um, And this is what I think, right? Waiting for a click to buy is like waiting for your pet cat to bark. It's never going to happen because clicks don't buy anything. People do. So why are we so obsessed with getting people to click shit? It's the wrong mentality completely. What we've got to do is work out how we get people to want to buy the awesome stuff that we've got and how to create advertising that's so compelling that it actually boosts someone's serotonin level when they click the advert. Anyone think they're capable of doing that? Few of you, I tell you, by the end of this, you will all be able to walk out of here with your hands held high, saying, I know how to make advertising that people actually want to click, so much so that I'm going to go right onto the speaker app, and I'm going to find Guy Levine, and I'm going to give him five stars and tell Kelvin the little shit that Guy should be on the main stage. (laughs) So I'll give you everything that I know if in return, you don't tell him that I called him a little shit because I love him to bits, but in return, you say making Guy take three trains uh, from Manchester to Brighton, he should definitely be on the main stage. So here we go. There's three elements to paid social success, right? One of them is understanding your customers. The challenge with paid social is no one is coming onto Facebook saying, please, guys, show me my next retargeting advert. Right? It just doesn't happen. So you have really, really got to understand your customers. The second thing that you've got to do is to understand how to target, how to build audiences. Right? The two go uh, hand in hand really closely together. Audiences, understanding what they want. And then finally, and the thing that I'm not going to spend my time telling you is which buttons to click. Because let's be honest, there's a Four Dummies book on every single button combination you could ever want to click. It's boring, and you know, you lot probably know how to do it already. So what I want to focus on is the stuff that's going to make a difference. I started my digital career years and years ago when you could buy a click on Overture for a cent. A click for a cent. Some of our clients now are spending like 40 quid for a click, right? Crazy stuff. So I would have come to SMX or SES or all of those conferences like years ago and I would have said, you know what the key is? Like replace that full stop for a hyphen and do an A-B test and see what happens. And maybe you could save yourself some money. And then as I got a little bit more advanced, I might have said we could do this thing called a Taguchi array and try 17 different variations. The challenge now is we're so far and so mature. Now that people are like not even watching TV and fast forwarding through the advert, We can't rely on lame shit like that in order to decide how we're going to create results. So I want to share some clever stuff with you. So how do we get to understand our customers? I mean, I'm one of those people, right? 24 hours in a day is not long enough for me. I mean, I just have to compress sleep because I get quite excited. And what I was thinking is like, what can I do to learn more? There's all this clever stuff that people do, psychologists, Freud, all that stuff that I'm not clever enough to understand. But ultimately, people have this conversation about what's going on in their brain, right? And that comes out in every day in the choices of clothes they wear and how they speak and what they do and what brands they love. So there's got to be a more intelligent way than going to a graphic designer that, by the way, does not have the term psychologist in their job title and say, how can we create some really good stuff? So what am I going to do? 
right, this stuff's going to get deep. Right, <laughs> I was at a conference and I was hearing about IBM Watson supercomputer. So this is a computer in the cloud that's really powerful. And what you're actually able to do is to rent it. And it can do really, really clever shit. And it can like take people's data and it can tell you a little bit about them. So I kind of went on and the challenge is with it, they've got a demo that you can play with and you can go on there and you can select, like I want you to do a personality profile on Oprah just by looking at her Twitter feed and tell me like who she is as a person. You can actually also copy bodies of text in there as well. So if you're not using this to pre-screen, copy and paste off LinkedIn, copy and paste off a CV, paste it into Watson and just make sure they don't say psycho because if they do, you can stop it early. I'm not sure if that's allowed anymore, but I do it. <laughs> And what it does is it gives you this lovely breakdown of the personality traits that these people show. So this is Oprah. Um, I know why Kelvin said no font smaller than 48. But trust me, it's got words around here like assertiveness and cheerfulness and how agreeable they are. All clever stuff. And uh, in, for Oprah in particular, uh, it talks about her being against the population, over-indexes by 90% on adventure and 90% on trust. So she likes adventure and trust is very important to her. This is the worst slide. I'm sorry. Please don't strike me down dead for having this. But this is some of like the clever stuff that goes on behind Watson. And basically what they've done from all of the research is said that because it's looking at Twitter, Everyone says, well, how does it know that? Um, we are about to set these slides live, and there will be a tweet, but I told them at the office, don't do it until I get to the boring stuff, because I don't want you knowing any of the jokes before they come. So you'll have a copy of all of this. So the first thing they said is people who score high on excitement seeking are more likely to respond. So I went to an amazing, amazing uh, talk before on influencer marketing, you know, in the cool sessions about influencers and SEO shit, even though we know SEO is well dead. Um, <laughs> in fact, it said in the speaker handouts, don't be sexist, don't be racist, and don't poke fun at SEO people. I'm probably going to. Um, but you know, when you're looking for influencers, Right? Would it not be good to go to the ones that you do a quick personality profile on and see the ones that are more likely to respond? Yeah, of course it will. It's like um, there was that old tool that you could, that, that Moz bought, that you could do all the um, searches and see how many people retweeted shit. This does much better. The second is score high. People who score high on cautiousness are less likely to respond. People who score high on modesty, openness, and friendliness are more likely to spread information. So if you're creating a piece of content and you're promoting it through social and all of that stuff, go on to this, put people's Twitter's address in, and actually bother going to the ones that are more likely to spread information because they're open. Modest and friendliness. You won't see modesty in mine, but I'm cool with that. So then I had another thought like, that's good. I kind of too small. That's good, but it, the problem with Watson in that demo is, is all you can do is take uh, the people that are in their thing. So, like Oprah and a few of the others, and it'll analyze some speeches. But I'm like, hold on a minute, right? We work with some massive e commerce brands, and all of them have a subset of their audience, of their customers that buy loads of stuff. And I've also got a tool that tells me what these people want to see according to the stuff that they write about themselves on Twitter. How can I get the two things together? So actually, if I can go one step and beyond and find out your 25 top customers index like this in a personality profile, therefore, I'm going to create advertising that talks to them directly, that is going to be some clever shit. And the next person that says to me, I'm really sorry, I'm going to bring that in-house because other people can do what you can do, I'll be like, not this shit. Sorry, there's probably loads of in-houses, but when you're in an agency, it's really frustrating. Um, so here's what I did, right? I went on to the IBM Watson Personality Insights tool. They do a free demo. They've got links to GitHub and Fork to get all of the code. The challenge is I haven't got a clue how to use GitHub. Anyone know how to use GitHub? Fuck. 
hats off. That is some complicated shit. So I went on and I did some research, and then I also found this framework called Buzzy. And what Buzzy allows you to do is to build applications really quickly. So I went on to Watson. I sent up for a 30-day trial. I went on to Buzzy. I set up for a free account. And what it allowed me to do is to produce this app in about 40 seconds, where I was able to give the person that I was profiling a name. I was able to put in their Twitter user details. I was able to press the submit button. And then go in, refresh, scrape Twitter, refresh the chart. And holy shit, there is a personality profile. That cost me zero pounds because it was all run off free trials or free accounts. And it cost me zero dev cost because I did it myself. <laughs> Am I at three stars yet? Because I've not finished yet. So again, what it allowed me to do now is you go to your clients, you go to the uh, ideal set of clients that you've got that respond the most or buy the most. You run each and every one of them through here. And then get one of these charts. And what it allows you to do is to understand what they really want. And Ashley's going to talk to you about how to create awesome adverts. But I think once you understand what they're thinking first, creating the adverts is like even better. And what I mean by that is, if someone or your ideal market score high on being adventurous and you're selling product, sticking it on a white background with nothing adventurous about it and putting it into the news feed or into an Instagram story is not going to work. Well, it will work, but it's not selling any adventure. Similarly, people that score over on trust, sending them all of this fantastic lifestyle imagery, yeah, sure, it works, but if you send them messaging that's got testimonials in it, right at the center of their core, they go, I trust this, other people are saying it's good. You play with this, create the app yourself, do it to influencers. It's just going to give you a really great insight on where to start. And this is what happens, right? Client, uh, £5,794 spend, £24,000 revenue. I'd have that, £4.20 for every pound I spend. I wish every one of my gambles paid off like that. But when you start to incorporate clever shit, £13,000 spend, £463,000 in revenue, £35 for every £1 spent. That's not going to happen by messing around with a full stop. That's got to happen by doing something that other people either can't think to do or are too lazy to do. So what do we do with all these audiences? We know what's going on now. Well, I actually think, and it might be some of you, because there's a stand giving beer away, but the best audiences are intelligent, well-educated, and let's be frank, a little bit pissed, because the more drunk the audience, the more you can get away with. So here's what we do. We look at traditional marketing funnels, and we overlay them against how we want uh, a social, a Facebook advertising campaign to work. At the top of the funnel, we're looking at things like click campaigns and fan campaigns. Anyone think that they can start to see that there's some lifestyle imagery that's coming here from actually having a clue what the people want to see? There's uh, one of the... Um, profile pieces that come up is hedonism. People that have a really good time want to enjoy it. It's there. Says to them, buy our stuff. Be psychologically rewarded with how you want to feel as a person. And also click campaigns. Uh, fan campaigns and click campaigns start to build new audience, start to build engagement. Then when you start wanting web visits, it's now start to go into remarketing and dynamic remarketing. Because someone's gone from a psychological intent to actually wanting to do something, that's where we can go more into product photography and things like that. So at new audience level, let them see it. Really start to entice them. Once they're starting to engage about it, let them think about it and start building some trust. When they want it, calls to action. And then when they want to buy it, give them an offer. It kills me to spout Google stuff, but right message, right place, right time, right offer. It works every single time. And also, 
at reach level, am I wet? I'm standing in front of it. At reach level, video is an absolute killer right at the beginning <laughs> of the uh, campaign, right when you're starting to define your audience. Lovely videography. And sometimes if you're working in product world, it can just be as simple as when the photo shoot's happening for the products that you're doing, get the photographer to flick it into video mode and to take like 20 seconds of video of behind the scenes footage. It works fantastically well in the campaigns and it's not expensive to produce. Banners and carousels drive traffic, and then collection and carousels are what we go into for driving conversions. Instagram stories, again, we're starting to look for the message that we're putting across in the advertising. They work really well for reach and awareness and across the main social channels. Uh, and the feed videos, again, <laughs> what we're not trying to do here is push sales. Right at the top of the funnel, we're looking to like sell our brand. We're looking to make people interact, to want to buy us. I don't know if any of you work in any commoditized marketplaces, but just pushing offer after offer after offer doesn't work. People need to want to do it. And then start moving into new audience carousels, lighter tone of voice, product images, but still no heavy sales hook and then remarket. That's when you're calling for the cash. That's when you want to go in heavy tone of voice and a sales hook to drive purchases. But we start early. The other problem that we always see is when people overburn their remarketing audiences. You know, when you just put offer and offer and offer and you speak to your marketing director or the CEO and they're like, oh, we're not going to you know, spend £35 an acquisition. Why can't we get the acquisitions at £2? It's like we know them already. If you kill them, if you go too high on your frequencies, then all of a sudden you've got nothing left. And then all of a sudden you get this massive shock because you're not in control of building a blended CPA that covers prospecting for new audiences and selling to the ones that love you already. Yeah, ROI, ROI's key. I've built a company called Return. Uh, the worst thing that could ever happen to me is something like a client speak to me and say, you haven't provided the return that we were looking for. I would just cry. But it works in lots of different places. So GDPR, don't ask me any questions about it because really I don't have a clue. There's someone at the front who really does. She wrote the white paper on it. But as all I'm going to say, and I don't want any questions about this because I will refuse to answer them, is while we still can use data and while we've still got our list, now's maybe the time to uh, use it and also start thinking about some of the lists that we can build within Facebook around the segments that we have in our CRM. So what I'm not talking about is all the people that have just signed up to your newsletter, but what I am talking about is people where you have more significant information, male, female, buyers, non-buyers, top 100 customers, not 100 customers, people that haven't interacted for three months. Start making some use with it. And then also what we want to do is do a little bit of prospecting. But these are some of the mistakes that we've seen. So yeah, it's more than a million pounds on Facebook now. So number one, yeah, exclude your web visitors and prospect and purchases from the last 60 days because the amount of people that think that their prospecting is working, but it's not actually. It's just reactivation of people that have not bought from you. Exclude all your existing likes from Facebook because let's be honest, that's not really prospecting for new, is it? And then use a range of targeting parameters. So I will talk in a little bit about some ideas that we had around that as well. Oh God. If you're doing the organic thing and want to build a, uh, some engagement as well, um, there is this little tool called Snipply. And what it allows you to do is when you tweet content, it will allow you to tweet anyone's content. But when they hit the page, it will allow you to put a little um, message and call to action at the bottom of that post like you see there or can't see because I didn't pay attention to the slide layout. Um, but it's just a nice way of once you've got this traffic, if you want to keep hold of it, um, it means that you don't lose it when you drive it to someone else's page. So remarketing to monetize your audience. Dynamic campaigns are cool now. Is anyone using product feeds and dynamic campaigns? Most of you, well, yeah, some of you definitely start using it. Feed's the key. Build a clean feed, know exactly what you want it to do. And effectively, we're doing the same as the major e-commerce retailers. We're making sure that the purchases that don't happen are being mopped up on the way out because you're paying to drive the traffic on the way in. But don't use it as your primary remarketing tool. Use the story as well. So don't be afraid to break it up a little bit. It's not always just about buy, buy, buy. And here was when I had another thought. There's got to be a better way. 
there's got to be a way to get more targeted. We've got massive custom audience ability. Um, I do also have to say it's not just me that's having the thinking. I've got two incredibly clever people that work with me in the front row, and quite a lot of this thinking comes down to one of them as well, not just me. But I always wished, and he always wished, if we could make more use of the referral source, the UTM code, and the time on site, to kind of give us more ideas on what we should be doing to the people that we're going to remarket to. So let me give you an example. If someone was to follow a YouTube link in order to come to my site, what kind of content are they going to be consuming before they come to me? You can shout it out. I won't bite. Video. So then when I would remarketing to them, what do you think would be better to send them? A video advert or a text advert? Video. So I wanted to say, how can I make that stuff happen within Facebook as well? And we did a little bit of research. And what we came up with is this platform called Connectio. Uh, it's a retargeting tool that allows you to do some clever stuff with the uh, Facebook pixel and its pixels to be able to do things like, say, retarget to people who spend more than 30 seconds on my site with different information to people that only spend five seconds on my site. And if you were really clever and wanted to wind in PBC and Facebook together and understood the demographic information that we were talking about in the first place, we could actually start building remarketing lists that were based on age, gender, interest, and then be able to follow them remarketing-wise with advertising that matched that as well. That would be absolute. Well, I would say it's the holy grail. That shit is possible nowadays. And if you're not doing it, you're missing out on a massive opportunity. And then, obviously, with Facebook, I think one of the main places that they're looking for now is this lookalike audiences. They're investing a lot of technology into how to create the lookalikes much more efficiently and effectively than they've ever used to. So that would definitely be something that I would be having a look at. I have got a little bit more time. <laughs> That is the link for the slides. Everything from now on is about clicking the button. There's only a few more slides left. Return.is slash at brightnessio. It comes up again in case you missed it. Don't worry. So the dirty secrets about Facebook that no one really wants to tell you. <laughs> the first one is they really, really, really want your money. So this is like AdWords in the olden days when it was just like, just spend more. Broad match is the answer. Pump thousands into it and it'll do. They're like that as well. And really, unless you're spending a quarter of a million pounds a month, don't expect any meaningful support. And also, the account manager churn is absolutely terrible. They change all the time, and they don't really care. And unfortunately, they're in the position to be able to do it. Um, so it's definitely something to keep an eye on. And to deliver the best return, don't deliver the same ads to the same users because it definitely doesn't work. And times of day don't all act the same as well. So there's lots of talk about multi-screening. So when people are on, you know, watching the TV and on their iPads as well. But there's also, they do those things at different times of the day. So if people are at work and they're not using that kind of way of doing things, don't display the same ads that you would do as if they were doing both. <laughs> and relevant scores. Here's a slide for relevant scores. So with a relevant score of 6, you're paying 34p a click. With a relevant score of 10, you're paying 19p a click. This should be one of the places that you're looking to tidy up as soon as you can. And attribution. Attribution between Facebook and Google Analytics. Oh, what could I say? If anyone knows a good way of doing it, why don't you let me know? Um, because it's really hard, uh, and it's really hard to explain to a client or explain to a CEO or a managing director or a marketing director. You know, you've got all of this information in Facebook. You've got all of this information in analytics. Any show of hands for people who think they can get it both to add up? One person, two people, three people. That's just your one hand going up higher. Three people <laughs> with both hands. Um, it's a challenge, but don't put off the fight, because we'll get there eventually um, to exactly see what's going on. We're looking at attribution platforms that are getting there better, but even the ones that would say they've nailed attribution haven't necessarily done it. And that's what we do. We work with brands. We help them sell more shit online. We do it by being <laughs> clever. And I look forward to now hearing Ashley, who's going to share how to do the adverts bit as well. Thank you. <laughs>
This was originally recorded at a Brighton SEO conference. If you want to listen to more episodes or find out about the conference itself, you can do at brightonseo.com.